Welcome to Swallow the Gap, the podcast that delves into the critical world of dysphagia practice and education. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Stockdale, and I'm thrilled to have you join us for conversations aiming to bridge gaps in understanding, knowledge, and implementation surrounding dysphagia intervention. We will be a force for change by inspiring critical thinking, facilitating discussion, and promoting professional development. Swallow the Gap is here to discuss, inform, inspire, and connect you with a vibrant community who is dedicated to making positive change. Together, we'll unpack challenges and be open about our own struggles and work to bridge gaps in our field that impact the lives of those living with swallowing difficulties. Our opinions should not be taken to represent our employers or the groups with whom we associate. Nothing we say is legal advice and nothing should be taken without scrutiny. While we strive for accuracy, we do not imply perfection. We value diversity in backgrounds and opinions, so our guests will not always reflect what we believe. In fact, we may change our minds on topics as we learn because this is how progress is made. Through discussion, critical thinking, and open minds, we serve as catalysts for advancement in medically focused speech language pathology. This episode of Swallow the Gap is sponsored by Brocco Diagnostics. Brocco is the maker of Verabar barium sulfate, the only contrast validated for standardized, well-tested protocols during modified barium swallow studies. For more information, visit verabarmbs.com. According to the CDC, data from 2015 indicate there are about 167,000 hospital-acquired pneumonias every year. So today, I have two advanced practice nurses with me one doctor of speech pathology, and then myself to try to keep things from getting too crazy. So these individuals, the reason why it's important that I invited these individuals, especially Dr. Aaron McCarthy. Aaron, your culminating project for your doctorate program was about what? It was about oral care, and it was about the impact of a dedicated and effective oral care program could be and could have on mitigating the incidence rate of non-ventilator hospital-acquired pneumonia. Okay. So pneumonia and oral care. We'll make that connection here. I also have Dr. Barbara Quinn, who's an adult clinical nurse specialist. Kathy Volman is a critical care clinical nurse specialist. And Aaron McCarthy, who was just speaking, is Dr. Aaron McCarthy is the director of clinical education at DeUville University. Did I say it right that time? You did, yes. <laughs> Not in Whoville, here at the Whoville. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you'd fit in either place, right? <laughs> so I'm going to blame you. I'm going to give you a heads up, Aaron. So on this form that I send out to everyone who's going to be on the podcast, there's a like, how serious do you want this to be? A one is like total no nonsense. And a 10 is just basically we're sitting here making noises and laughing at each other and stuff. Aaron picked an eight. And so you might be the butt of a couple jokes. Just dish it right back. For every one joke I put out to somebody else, there are at least eight that could be thrown right back at me. But anyway, all I'm really thankful to have you all on here. Brilliant individuals. And what I love about this is this is our first interdisciplinary podcast where we're having advanced practice nurses and speech pathologists. We've been focused on SLPs, researchers, clinicians, but not pure medical, like more broadly speaking, medical practitioners. So if you don't mind, Dr. Quinn or Barbara, can you tell me a little bit about what you would like for people to know, a little bit about the day-to-day of your work and why this is relevant to you? Well, I'm recently retired, but I'm still uh, doing this work because it's so incredibly important to me. I have been working in acute care for 30 years, and my program of research since 2010, uh, 2011, was this problem of patients coming to the hospital for one thing and then acquiring pneumonia while they're with us. The majority of those cases that I discovered were not in the ICU. They were not in patients on ventilators. They were outside of the ICU. And back in the day, there just wasn't anything in the literature about it. So that really launched my program of research, my interest and my passion, and I'm still working on it including today. Very cool. Very cool. I've heard the saying, or at least I've told patients I've worked with before, like I hope uh, in acute care, like I hope you get out of here soon so you don't get sick. Basically that sort of thing. You come to the hospital to get well and you stay long enough and then you get sick again. Kathleen, can you tell me a little bit about why this is relevant to you and just anything you want people to know? Well, 44 years 
in critical care, oh. 10 directly at the bedside, then 13 as a clinical nurse specialist. And that's mm-hmm. where my passion started when I was a frontline nurse. And the place I worked at saw fundamental nursing care as important as any medical component of our care that we gave. I took that into my CNS role and I saw challenging mouths (laughs) of Mm -hmm. ventilator patients in the 90s. And I started a journey on oral hygiene and the impact it had on ventilator-associated pneumonia in the 90s. And then moved forward with my consulting and focusing on nurses' role in preventing harm. And preventing harm. That's, yeah, that's where my passion lies. That's such a weird take on it. We, I at least think of nurses as one of the most helping professions out there. And you're like, it sounds like you're wrangling like the gangster nurses. Like, we're not going to let you hurt people anymore. <laughs> like, well, no, it's our role in preventing harm happening to the patient. Right. Um, not not from your... Not no, from us. No, not no. from nurses. No. No, no, I get what you're saying. But from not providing yeah. the right care, like oral hygiene, to reduce Absolutely. pneumonia or turning to prevent a pressure injury, things like that. Oh, man. <laughs> Absolutely. You all have your hands full. Not too long ago, I'm going to say within the last month or, or maybe two, there was a patient I was seeing at the ICU. They were concerned about him having dysphagia and bedside evaluation is extremely limited, but based upon what I saw at bedside, I was like, yeah, I'm kind of concerned about this fella and his mouth, like look in his mouth and it just looks like no one has seen it in a year. So horribly like this poor fellow, like no one's taking care of his oral hygiene. And to me, that at that point is a bigger concern than his dysphagia or his potential dysphagia. But I think mm-hmm. talk a little bit more about that later. So really great insight. Uh, I think teamwork is going to be the key to helping this. Aaron, I would love to hear a little bit more about what you found in your culminating project research or just anything that you think is most exciting to this. I think from a speech pathologist standpoint, as you just talked about, we're going in to evaluate the oral pharyngeal swallow of the mm-hmm. patient. And oftentimes we're walking in there and we're finding these patients who are coming either from the community or from skilled nursing facilities or assisted rehab facilities who haven't had their teeth brushed or their mouth cleaned out in God knows how long. Before we do anything with regards to a clinical swallowing evaluation or giving them something to eat or to drink to assess their swallow, we need a clean mouth. We need that oral cap to be clean because we don't want them, God forbid they do have dysphagia and they're at risk for aspiration. We don't want them to be micro aspirating or grossly aspirating that bacteria, that biofilm. So we really want to start with a quote unquote clean palate as you would. This was a huge initiative for me at my former hospital where I was the supervisor for 22 years and my team and I really implemented a very effective oral care program over the years and became very well known amongst the nurses, the providers, the APPs, the ICU intensivists for saying like, oh, okay, you want how much, how often do you want us to do oral care? You want us to use the enhanced oral care kit in order to clean out the patient's mouth. So they knew that was something that I was automatically going to recommend for all of our patients just to keep their mouths clean. And I think for me, in doing my capstone, really seeing the impact that an oral care program can have on our patients and on their care and on mitigating the risk that they might develop a non-ventilator hospital acquired pneumonia was just astounding to me. And I spoke with both Kathleen and Barb throughout my capstone project. I referenced them and their research and everything. It's such a simple intervention that somehow we really have to continue to try to get leadership behind staff to have that buy-in and to educate them (laughs) why this is so important and enhance patient care, patient outcomes, patient satisfaction, and reduce overall length of stay, which is going to then cut down on the financial burden that our healthcare system currently suffers from. It seems like such a simple thing 
I know that nurses are busy. Speech pathologists have their productivity requirements. They see so many patients and, oh, if you take time to find a toothbrush and do oral care and everything else, that could add another 10 minutes, which is only 10 minutes. And it's a pretty big deal. But at the same time, companies might not see that as skilled care or billable, but it's essential. So we have a system that's not necessarily set up to recognize how important that is. So I think discussions like these are essential to help people realize that it might be simple and you might not have to be able to split an atom to know how to do it, but it's pretty, pretty important. Mm -hmm. Tim, Um, I got to tell you, Barb did a cost analysis on the cost savings in her institution. What type of institution? When she was at a acute care facility. About how many, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you because this is very interesting to me. How About how many beds? I just want to know a couple so more. So Barb, why don't, you, why don't you tell that story? Because I, it blew yeah. me out of the water. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We were measuring non-ventilator hospital acquired pneumonia. These okay. are the hospital acquired pneumonia is not related to ventilator care. Okay. And in one year, we had over a hundred of them Okay. that before that had been totally unrecognized under the radar. So about a um, hundred non-ventilator acquired, non-ventilator hospital acquired pneumonias. Yes. In one and year. And this is a 350 bed hospital. So it's not a massively large facility. Not huge, not huge. Um, yeah. So yes, it was very startling oh, yeah. and shocking, I would say. And that shock helped us get our oral care program in place. Really important, by the way, to get the data so that you know what you're working with. Once you see it, you can't unsee it, can't unknow it. So data first, and then we put oral care in place, and we prevented 37% of our hospital-acquired pneumonias not related to a ventilator in one year, and it saved millions of dollars. If you add up the cost of each hospital acquired pneumonia is estimated about $40,000. It varies quite a bit based on length of stay. But if you compare the cost of that to the cost of the toothbrush and the oral care equipment, yeah. it's just a drop in the bucket. Prevention pays. Prevention is worth it. Oh, absolutely. About a 350 bed acute care facility. One year you had 100 non-ventilator hospital acquired pneumonias. Right. Estimated, Tim, Estimate. estimated at costing the organization $4 million. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. 40,000 times the 100 people. Lots and lots and lots of money. And so you For say- one hospital. One hospital yeah. in the whole country. So in your first year, that was your first year, you reduced it by yeah. 37%. Yes. That's tremendous. And were there a whole lot of other things that that changed or was this your primary driving force? That was the primary driving force. The second year, we added a few other things that we felt like could contribute to decreasing the risk for pneumonia. We worked on our NG protocol to make sure that because we know that having tubes in increased the risk for aspiration. We worked with pharmacy to reduce the amount of proton pump inhibitors uh, that were just staying on these patients forever, trying to decrease those a little bit. I think the biggest push we did at the end of our research program was we started brushing the teeth of patients before they had surgery. It's like we had come down quite well in our incidence of every month of hospital acquired pneumonia, but we still had these breakthrough cases Mm-hmm. It was like, what What do these patients have in common? They Most of them had surgery uh, two or three days before. Okay. And so when, so I thought, well, I wonder what kind of oral care they're doing down in pre-op. Well, they weren't, just wasn't in their <laughs> vocabulary, wasn't in their thought processes. And once I showed them their post-op pneumonia data, they were happy to work together and add oral care to just the pre-op routine. They have their CHG bath, they brush their teeth. And we reduced our post-op pneumonia by 75% within six months. Wow. So we know it works. We know it saves money. We know it saves lives. One in every five of these patients who get pneumonia will die. One in five who survive will be readmitted within 30 days to the hospital. 30 30 to 40% 
if they survive and don't come back to the hospital, will need a, a higher level of care, like acute rehab or a extended nursing yeah. stay. It just the the cost is mm-hmm. exponential beyond the cost we see in the hospital. And not to mention, think about the patient's family and then all they have to go through. So it's obviously near and dear to my heart. I just know that we can do better, right? With a low cost, a low risk, simple intervention. It it makes a tremendous amount of sense. If you've ever been in food services, you learn about the exponential growth of bacteria. You're like, you leave this piece of meat out for an hour, then you get these many, this many bacteria, and then another hour, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. If you think about in the mouth, it's not just, oh, you get a few more bacteria every hour. It grows exponentially, just like yes. dynamite. It's insane. Yes. Yeah. And five so- times, they replicate <laughs> five times in 24 hours. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a lot. So even if you think about even a micro aspiration, one ml of saliva contains up to 100,000 microbes. And if you have pneumonia pathogens in that glob of microbes, you're inoculating your lungs with that. Yeah. And imagine what if someone has like a MRSA in the in their lip, like a oh, yeah. MRSA wound or something like that. I think John, I remember John Ashford in a presentation a while ago talking a lot about that it has more even to do with the virulency of the pathogen. You know, if it's MRSA or something else like that, then the number of pathogens within there, which was fascinating to me, but it makes so much sense. It's in your mouth. People aspirate in their sleep. You know, it's not uncommon. Right. Hard to get rid of all aspiration. I don't think it's possible to get rid of all aspiration. So why not brush teeth, keep the mouth clean? It's very intuitive. But what I love about what you've done is you put data behind it. I think that's where the impact is when we're trying to go and sell this to facilities. I met with a rehab facility recently about doing this, and they were very interested. But it fizzled out into, oh, yeah, the lead CNA is going to take the lead of this. And I don't know if they're putting any data with it or anything like that. But if spending just a little extra time to quantify it, because that number is unbelievable. You saved roughly $4 million in one year by brushing teeth. That is just... Oh, $2 million. $2 million. Wait. Yeah, by a 37% reduction of $4 million. Right. That's $2 million. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, million. I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. So your total cost... Let's see here. Let's, oh, let's, yeah, yeah. 37% so, of 4 million, well, like one and a half, roughly. Right. That's still a right. ton of money. Yeah. I mean, you could pay at least one cardiac surgeon, right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Maybe a few, maybe a few. So here, let me get, I'm going to get that math out here. I misunderstood that. I'm sorry. Barb, I think your research said it was $1.72 million. Right. And that oh, was the c- cost avoided of from the pneumonia avoided minus the costs of the supplies, the oral care. Which was about a hundred thousand. Yeah. Wow. That's something you know, else. I, mean, I want to say, because I remember Tim, you reached out to me about that initiative at the, the rehab facility. And yeah. you know, I sent yeah. you some articles. And I believe Barb's was the one, one of the ones oh. that I will say, and this is not just because she's a friend of mine, but <laughs> when you talk about seminal articles and literature on certain topics and everything, I would say that Barb and Diane Baker's happy study from 2014, right, Barb? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was published 2014. In nursing scholarship. For for oral care. And it's something that you'll see is, is referenced all the time. Speakers reference it, other literature references it. So even having that data facility, it might not be applicable to your size and your facility, but even having that data, this is what they did Mm -hmm. and it was intervention and this was where they started and this was their outcome. Mm -hmm. That alone, taking it to leadership and saying, okay, so let's extrapolate out or let's look at our own publicly reported data. For all healthcare organizations, you have to publicly report how many pneumonias, how many, you know you have, the APs you have, um, taking a look at that and saying, okay, if we take our math for and our data from our um, facility, how much could we potentially save? Absolutely. Uh, I think that's just mm-hmm. critical and, and should be part of the sales pitch to any mm-hmm. leadership. Well, the goal is, and it, it's been building 
over the last 10 years is putting this on the national spotlight in NHSN, Mm -hmm. the National Safety Healthcare Network, having collective measurement. And recently there was a publication by, it was a Jones in JAMA, where they evaluated 268 hospitals looking at their data using an electronic extraction to be able to get non-vent hospital-acquired pneumonia data. So there's now an easy, easier way, and that's now mm-hmm. been made public, an easier yeah. way to get your own hospital data and not necessarily right. have to rely on the research literature, but say, here, you don't think you have a problem? Check it out. It's truly a breakthrough. Uh, I think the facilities have really struggled uh, because all we've had is administrative data, the ICD-10 codes, and everybody knows that they're not as accurate as you would like them to be when you're trying to measure an improvement or be penalized. And so that's the CMS, CDC, they've been very reluctant to put a measure in place when there's not an easier, more valid, more objective way to measure hmm. non-ventilator hospital card pneumonia. Well, now we have it. Yeah. So the Jones study that Kathleen mentioned is one of the first ones. Um, the interesting thing is that the incidents and the outcomes are very similar to all the other studies that have already been done. So really, no matter Validates how you measure it. this, yep. yeah, yeah, no matter how you look at it, whether it's a one hospital study or a nationwide study or a point prevalence study or an incident study or just an ICU or med surge, the impact on our patients is the same. The outcomes are the same, Mm -hmm. but this is this new electronic algorithm that's now available. Dr. Michael Klomp has helped spearhead that. I think it's going to be a huge breakthrough. It's also it's open access in JAMA open access. So anybody can go on Pull that out. It's right in the supplement. Take it to your IT people, get it in your EHR and run it. It's the first really feasible, objective opportunity we've had to measure NVHAP nationally. What type of parameters do you plug into that? After you've had this program integrated within your EMR, what, what do you have to do after that? Well, once you get the numbers, mm-hmm. Is that what you're talking about? No, it's well, pulling clinical data, Tim. Right. Oh, it's already there. Yes, yes. Ah, yes. So it's it, already there and right. putting okay. it together with an algorithm. Okay. And right. they've been able to identify that the accuracy of that mm-hmm. is high. Yeah. And yeah. no pun intended, you can actually take the data and uh-huh. take it to the bank. That right. this is yeah. real stuff. Right. Well, so the, it's objective data. Fever, that, antibiotic placement, mm-hmm. right? X ray ordering. Yeah, ordering the X ray or the chest CT, the fever, white count, all of those things are taken within in. a time frame of each other. I guess I think where I was getting thrown off, and it's probably because I was writing down a note about something that I thought you said was brilliant and just missed a nuance to something that you said. So I was thinking more in terms of oral care too, because in order to pull that out too, you've got to add that parameter to your EMR because most people don't have an oral parameter. with Oral oral care is in nursing charting. Yeah. But whether it's done or not. No, that's a different. And and so once measuring outcome, this new Jones um, algorithm is measuring the outcome, which then allows right. you to put in your intervention like oral hygiene, True. assess. There's a couple of ways to assess it. One, on charting, but charting is not always accurate. I also like to measure how much product has moved right. based on the number of patients and how frequent it should be done mm-hmm. yeah. and determine efficacy of the procedure that way as well. Right. Yeah. It's also good to walk in the room and see if the toothbrush package is open. Yeah, that yeah. works too. <laughs> liar, liar. Pants <laughs> on. Okay. The company I want to throw out there with this is, in, in my mind at least, I don't live in the nursing world. As far as like in the rehab world, there's so much of this fee-for-service mentality. You go in and you bill this and they say, oh yeah, bill for a treatment after your evaluation and, and trying to wiggle more billable codes into what we do. 
even though if someone's admitted to the hospital, the hospital gets paid a lump sum per diagnosis. And so I guess we're vouching for a more of a piece of the pie and maybe for the hospital to be able to advocate, say, we need more money to treat this. It feels like very linear from the rehab side that we're not thinking outside of the box. We're looking at, oh, we make more money by sell selling more stuff or billing more things. So we bill a code for a swallow eval, a swallow treatment, a speech language evaluation versus not doing things that are necessarily billable, but doing things like this that then prevent a hospital acquired infection that the hospital's not going to get paid by insurance, but they're going to foot $40,000 to pay for this or a readmission or a number of other things. I think that at least within the world that I've, much of the world that I've experienced, we think so linearly, we've got a bill to get more money versus I'm going to be less productive as a therapist. If I go in and, and brush my patient's teeth, swab their mouth after I brush their teeth, have them rinse and spit, moisturize their gums, whatever, that might take 10 or 15 minutes. And I might, on average, see two fewer patients a day. However, the patients I did see, I'm much more likely to or get more money indirectly for the hospital by preventing an infection that the hospital would have to pay for. And, and I'm, I'm speaking in terms of dollars and cents, and I feel like Scrooge over here doing that because the main outcome is this is going to help our patients live longer, be out of the hospital. No one wants to be in the hospital for too long. And so get out of the hospital sooner and just have a better quality of life related to that. So I don't know. That's just one of my takeaways that it seems sometimes it's these things are counterintuitive, like rehab directly. Oh, you, you can't bill for that. You got to do more. Your units aren't high enough. Your productivity is not high enough. But I think we can make a case in so many ways that the things that we do when we focus on quality end up not only helping the patient, but they end up helping the hospital's bottom line. And the fact that this is quantifiable, that you've been able to quantify it, is just remarkable because this theory that I've been thinking about for a long time, now there is data to bring this validity, to bring momentum to this theory and really make it sink in with directors and, and those in leadership. And I think from a speech perspective, though, too, not looking at it as I'm not just going into each of my patients rooms just to brush their teeth and then I'm mm -hmm. walking out. You know I mean? like, right. It's part of something else to that skilled service that I'm offering them, my assessment, my mm -hmm. clinical swallow evaluation, my modified barium swallow study or my fees. That's the first thing that I'm doing is I'm looking in my patient's mouth to make sure that they're not pocketing meds or scrambled eggs from breakfast or that I have that clean oral cavity prior to me doing my skilled assessment or my skilled intervention. So I think you can just look at it as, or think about it like, I'm going to be spending 30 minutes on two patients only brushing their teeth. That's not what we're doing. Right. And I think there's also an opportunity and a partnership that if you find that mouth not what it needs to be, that there is an educational opportunity with the registered nurse or the mm -hmm. uh, certified nurse assistant to talk about what's the oral care program for this patient, help me to understand mm -hmm. why the mouth was in this condition. I'm bringing you a brief interruption that helps to keep this podcast going. There are hours and hours that go into producing each episode, and I'm very thankful that Brocco Diagnostics is sponsoring this episode of Swallow the Gap. Brocco is the maker of Verabar barium sulfate products, which are FDA approved and the only pre-mixed, pre-measured, and precise barium products for modified barium swallow studies. For more information, please visit verabarmbs.com. That's V-A-R-I-B-A-R-M-B-S.com. You both have worked on the floor prior to getting your advanced degree. Yes. From this perspective, because I struggle with this, when I come in, I don't just want to like, this patient's mouth is gross. What on earth are you doing? I want to sell it in a way that dysphagia is really important, but whether or not this person gets pneumonia, there are data out there that show that their oral hygiene is actually more important than that. I really think it's important that we do oral hygiene four times a day, but what is a way that you would recommend for speech pathologists or whoever to communicate this in such a way that is not as likely to put the nurse on the defensive, like we're criticizing what they've done because they work their butts off and I don't want to be, I don't want them yeah. thinking I'm being critical. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes from my experience, the RN just expects the nursing assistant to take care of it 
for one thing. It's not always the greatest communication between the two. And the nurses are busy doing things that the nursing assistant can't do, and they'll tell them that. And I think a lot of nursing assistants have no idea, truthfully, no idea that it's germs in the mouth that get into the lungs that cause pneumonia. I think there's a a true lack of understanding and education. One of the things we did was we made a little, just to help make the invisible visible, we printed off pictures of the bacteria and how quickly it replicates in one shift without oral care. And we laminated those and we gave them to our staff. Um, And it was not only helpful educating the staff, but it was also really great to use with the patients and families when you go in and say, hey, have you brushed your teeth this morning? They says, oh, I already I brushed them two days ago. I don't need to do it now. And then it gives them a teaching moment, too, and a tool they can use it. Making something visible helps them understand it. But education is a huge a huge issue. Do you have an an Etsy account or like a teachers pay teachers? Because I'm going to get emails about people wanting that graphic. (laughs) If you charge five cents, you might be a billionaire. I I will send you the picture with the source. Biofilm. Yeah. It's the biofilm slide. It's been all over the country. Yep. This is your new revenue stream in retirement. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. You could do some major consulting with this. In fact, Let's talk after this. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about some potential, but this is excellent. Excellent. I'm but going that, to, yeah, that go conversation, Tim, is really an educational conversation. Yeah. yeah. To ensure that the awareness exists. Right. And then one can even take it further if you end up, let's say you consult on a neuro unit a lot. Okay. Because you're evaluating the swallow, you can take it to the manager and say, hey, I'm consistently seeing some challenges with this. Yeah, love that. So, yeah. So- the, mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, Tim. Sorry to interrupt you. But I, I was just thinking of some of the work I've done on implementation science. And there's when you're talking with staff on the floor doing direct patient care, The best person to talk to them to get their behavior to change that they respect the most is not necessarily the speech therapist. It's their direct one up, uh, the one they directly report to for for performance. And so I I love Kathleen's uh, advice to work with the managing or the director of the unit to get their support. And they can help share that message really probably more effectively. Not that you can't work together, but you're then come in more as a partner and we're taking care of our patient and let the manager talk to him about some of the practice issues. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Earlier we were talking and I believe we're all familiar of this idea of this impact effort matrixy. So on one axis, you have impact. And so whatever it is that we're thinking about implementing or doing oral hygiene protocol, whatever it is, we plot that on the potential impact that we think it'll have. High impact, so it's going to go up high. Low impact, will go down low. And then on the other axis, you have effort. How much effort is this going to take? Is it going to be a lot or is it going to be a little effort or anywhere in between? And what is so cool about this is it's unequivocally high impact. And it seems like it's so low effort. It seems like it does not take, I mean, at least just the act itself is not that hard. Like you're not acting, asking people to go to a 10 week training and spend a bunch of money. You're asking them to do something that they've done all of their lives since they were maybe three or two brushing their teeth, but for somebody else and when they're busy and some other things. So what I would like to ask you, and you've mentioned some already, because this just makes so much sense to do as a high impact, low effort procedure. What are the biggest gaps toward this? What do you think are some of the biggest gaps? I know some of these will be summarizing because you mentioned them earlier. For me, it's the overall culture of the importance of fundamental nursing care in preventing harm to your patients and seeing that as important as any medical component that a nurse or a CNA does. Mm -hmm. So 
the edu- I see the education is part of that culture, but also even the culture of it's how you reward, how you reward and recognize yeah. people for the care practices that they do. If you look at the structure of the way most of our environments are, Mm -hmm. nurses and CNAs immediately know when they don't follow a doctor's order. They immediately know when they don't give a medication on time. They immediately know when they don't draw blood or do a dressing or a treatment. Nobody flags them on the oral hygiene. Nobody flags them on the turning. Nobody flags them on those aren't reinforced either positively or negatively the same Mm -hmm. way. And as a result, people ration it out. It's a psychological principle. Yeah. You do what you're reinforced and you let go with what isn't reinforced. Yeah. If there's not to change that. Okay. Okay. So improve accountability. It sounds like Mm -hmm. a big part of that. Okay. Yeah. And and also think, we, oh. Let me just throw out something really fast. The idea, too, with kind of power distance and, and how we perceive different individuals in healthcare. You look at the neurosurgeons and you look at the cardiac surgeons, like the untouchables, like, whoa, don't, you know, let me sweep your path before you walk down the hallway, that sort of thing. And that has a lot of impact. You know, they're saving lives. But then if you make the comparison that if you do oral hygiene, you might save more lives, right? So to me, it's this idea of like how we perceive people. And and so I don't know, maybe that factors into it some too. But if we say, look at what these cardiac surgeons are doing, they're saving a lot of lives and doing something very tricky, but you can do something, in my opinion, that's equally or almost equally as important. So, it's, the yeah. pride. it's the pride and understanding yeah. how you contribute individually mm-hmm. yeah. and collectively yeah. as a group. Um, I think it's the leadership buy-in too, is that the trickle down message that comes from above, if it's not mentioned, if it's not prioritized, if it's not like you were saying, Kathleen recognized, and that there's not an awareness of what the impact is, you know, everyone's so focused on those pay for performance measures and let's prevent falls and reduce caudies and all of that. But we're not looking at pneumonia and think about the population in our facilities that have some sort of pneumonia, mm-hmm. VAP, VAP, community-based, you know, um, healthcare associated acquired pneumonia. For me, it was always the leadership buy-in and recognition. Yeah. I think what I've seen, even with hospitals and systems that understand, have the education, have the data, they have also been even though it seems toothbrushing is a simple intervention, even a simple behavior change when it requires everybody to change mm-hmm. um, their prioritization and how they practice is not easy to right. make happen. And that's why I really stress implementation science. And I think a, a lot of the things we've mentioned here today are really important parts of implementation science. You have to influence the staff in ways that make it personally important, make it important to them as a team and how they, their culture, and we need to support them structurally. And that's all part of that influencer model of behavior change. I also think, I loved what you said about the education and the people who are actually doing the work to help them understand the value added to simple things like brushing the teeth. When we were working at our hospital on the first oral care research project that we did, we found that the nursing assistants really didn't had no understanding of why it was so important and what their real role was and why uh, it was not it was something they should prioritize. And I got to tell you, after we did the classes and we gave them the pictures and they got to help design the program on their unit, I had a nursing assistant approach me and she said, I used to come to work feeling like my job was just doing what nobody else wanted to do. Mm-hmm. It was not important. And she goes, now I come to work. And I know that if I make sure that those basic needs are taken care of in my patient, including brushing their teeth, I could be saving their life. Absolutely. And it totally turned around 
her uh, perspective and her priorities. And she felt so good about what she was doing. So I do think that is a missed opportunity in many places that we're not capitalizing on the hearts and minds of the people mm-hmm. who are actually in there being expected to do the work, right? Oh, for sure. uh, and that may not be quite so true in the ICUs where they have more RNs doing that care. Uh, mm-hmm. But definitely when you're talking about NVHAP, three quarters of these cases are not in the ICU. They're out on the floors. Whereby also most people, 80% of our patients outside of the ICU can actually brush their own teeth. So again, that's where it may not take that much time for the nursing staff, but they definitely need to be doing the education and holding the patients accountable for doing it. Well, and Barb Barb made a really important point, the structure piece. You got to make it easy for people to do the right thing. You got to make sure you have the right tools and those tools are easy, Mm -hmm. the evidence-based, and they're easy to use so that it fits into the workflow as much as possible. Yeah, Right. And they shouldn't have to walk a half a city block to go get a toothbrush. Mm -hmm. They should be at the bedside. Even people that build cars have the tools they need right next to them. Nobody makes them go walk to the room to get a tool, right? (laughs) We need to do, we need to make it easy and have a structure in place where the nurses, the nursing assistants, the patients have what they need at the point of care. I I love the implementation science perspective where you're taking what you know is good and just finding the best way to actually make it happen and not just exist Mm -hmm. in some nebulous study out there. Right. But as we wrap up, there are just a few things that I want to make sure to touch on. First of all, I believe that people are so much more invested in what they're doing when they find purpose and meaning to it. So thank you for bringing that meaning, that story. I can't imagine how many CNAs or however, how many other people feel that way about their jobs. I mean, I know I feel like that about my job. Sometimes I feel like there's a lot of redundancy and that my efforts aren't necessarily making as big of an impact as they could. And so just that affective personal component means a whole lot. So the last two things that I wanted to to cover is I want to talk about maybe baby steps to getting this started in a place that's a little more resistant to change. But also, what is your recommended oral hygiene routine? What do you think makes a good oral care? Well, the American Dental Association has approved back in 2017 an oral care protocol for hospitalized adults. Okay. And that called Based for off uh, of your research. Yeah. Well, yes. You mentioned thank that. You. I wanted thank to you, make sure that got person. in there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, based on my research. Um, <laughs> for healthy people, they recommend uh, brushing the teeth twice a day. Okay. Of course, none of our patients in the hospital are healthy and none of them are low risk, really. So we recommend in that protocol four times a day. That's not always easy to get it done that way. And a new study just came out by Aaron Zello that said a minimum of twice a day, but three or four times a day, not necessarily that much better for not as we're not talking about vented patients. We're talking about others. So I would say somewhere between two and four times a day. And you want to have a a soft bristle toothbrush, a therapeutic toothpaste that actually removes biofilm with enough fluoride or sodium bicarbonate or something that helps remove that plaque. They also recommend for people at higher risk for pathogens in the mouth, uh, some sort of uh, antimicrobial mouth rinse. We recommend, they recognize uh, CPC or acetylpyridinium chloride or hydrogen peroxide. Did I say that right, Kathleen? Yeah, 1.5%. 1.5. 1.5%? Yeah. Yeah. Those are over the counter. They're not. uh, Right. Of CPC uh, or of hydrogen peroxide? No, that 1.5% hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Is there any recommendation for moisturizer within the mouth if that's going to dry it out? That is a component? (laughs) Yeah, I I would say a non-petroleum based moisturizer and not just for the lips, for inside the mouth, right? So 
one of the main complaints of patients in the ICU is dry mouth, that's thirst. So yeah. it's a real need for our patients. And of course, we don't want to forget denture care. First of all, patients with no teeth still need oral care for one thing. And then secondly, if they have dentures or they're wearing them, they need a therapeutic denture care to keep those clean and germ-free. And I think one thing that I want to say about oral care is that to com really complete oral care, you have to actively debride the oral mucosa. So going in and using the pink swabs and dipping them in water and, and swishing them around the mouth is not oral, oral care. <laughs> right. So glad you said that, Aaron. Well, that, I think that's a huge misconception, too. Yes. And I'll ask a lot of times, have they had oral hygiene? It'll be like, yeah, I swabbed their mouth really good. I put some of this stuff on it. and But anyway, so yeah, thank you. So the patients who have dentures, the literature does show that it's best to have the patients take their dentures out and soak them overnight, not let them sleep with their dentures in. Now, this is a very big pride issue for a lot of patients who have dentures. And so we have to take that into account. I'm always talking to my staff about it during my presentations. I'll say you have to consider the patient's pride and what's their typical routine. They might not want to be seen without their teeth ever. And so we have to take that into consideration and they might not want to soak their dentures overnight. And that's fine. The literature does show that it's best have them out and soak them overnight, but we have to take that into account. But for those patients who have dentures, when we take those dentures out, mm -hmm. the oral mucosa still needs to be debrided, the lips, yes. the cavities, the tongue, the hard palate. So brushing all of those structures is included in oral care. It's not just brushing the dentures and rinsing them and then putting them back in the mouth. Right. What about right. the timing? So you said two to four times a day, ideally four times mm -hmm. a day. Um, two minutes. Okay, two minutes. But what about when you do it, particularly with our patients with dysphagia, like before breakfast, after breakfast, that type of thing with timing? Honestly, I usually recommend before. Yeah. I'm just happy if they do it at all, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah. That was going to be my response, too. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, yeah, I'm thinking of patients with dysphagia. So say that someone had their teeth cleaned four times a day maybe right before they go to sleep, right when they wake up. And then it's a late lunch at one o'clock. They were up at seven. It's been several hours and they it might aspirate a little bit of their milk or their water, or whatever. It would make mm -hmm. sense a lot to clean their mouth right before that too. It, it, if there's a known diagnosis of dysphagia, I would at least put that out there. And I think this is not, it's not just a health issue, but it's a quality of life issue too, because Patients with dysphagia are often you need thick and liquids, you need this, that, or whatever, which can potentially, and I'm not saying they're all bad, but they're potential to cause some other issues. And for quality of life with this, if you can keep someone's mouth super clean, at least me personally, I'm much less concerned that they're aspirating some water. So yeah, have sips of water, have ice chips. I know mm -hmm. you're aspirating, but you're not aspirating MRSA, right? <laughs> they're at least not right. Very, so a big quality of yeah. life thing. The last thing, these conversations, the hardest part about them is making them short enough because there's so much that we can touch on. I still have to figure that out. But baby steps to maybe a facility that is resistant to this. And I know you talked about talking with leadership, so I'm probably asking a very redundant question. So maybe if you would just summarize a couple of things for people to, to do to get the ball rolling. I'm going to jump in here for my facility. When we started looking at this in 2008, we really just kind of got together with nursing education and we were meeting with them pretty informally along with our oral care product vendor and just talking about like, okay, how can we improve the supplies? How can we improve the care? But then it just kind of morphed into this broader discussion, interdisciplinary discussion where when I was talking with my physical and my occupational therapy colleagues, they would talk to me about when they noticed their patients coming down to the gym or they were doing therapy with them, that their mouths looked so much better. They didn't have crusted dried secretions on their lips, on the front of their teeth. Their breath smelled better. The patient seemed to be happier because their mouths had been cleaned and that first initial step had been done. So I really started working with OT and PT too, to try to incorporate 
oral care into their sessions. And occupational therapy really stepped up and even created like an oral care zone in the gym. So when the patients would come to them, they would go and they would have oral care supplies. And then that was part of their thing. Physical therapy would get them up. They'd walk them into the bathroom. Occupational therapy would work with them on completing the ADL and doing the oral care. And they had all of those supplies right there. And so it ticked off all of those things, PT, OT, and speech. It was an interdisciplinary approach. The patients were happier. They were more satisfied. Oral care was getting done. So even having just a discussion with some other team members to say, okay, how can we do this? How can we implement an effective program? Yeah, I love that. I appreciate it. I think there's so much more that we can do when we're working in an interdisciplinary type setting. We all target specific areas and we have our boundaries that are within our scope of practice, but the body has no boundaries. It works together. Like this influences that and that influences this. And so it makes sense that providers that target those different areas would work together too. And we get a lot, a lot more bang for the buck, even with Mm -hmm. pneumonia, considering physical therapy for the mobility, speech pathology for the dysphagia, maybe oral care, nursing for medications and oral care, and so many other things. There's just We can truly get so much more uh, from this, so many more outcomes when we're collaborating and willing to work together. But thank you all so much. I know I know you have to run. I'm sorry. What was that? Very true. Very true. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Take down the silos. Let's put put ourselves out there. Yeah, man, I would love to keep talking about this. Thank you so much. I'll take some resources later and put them in the episode comments. But unless there's anything that you're just like, I have to say this before I go. We'll probably wrap up. Is there anything like that? You said- well, it's been a it's been a pleasure, Tim. Yeah, You'll thanks. have to have us back. Yeah, no, thanks for the this opportunity. Is, this is great. I've got a couple ideas. So thank you so much, everybody. Again, let's go back to Dr. Barbara Quinn, Kathleen Volman, Dr. Aaron McCarthy. Thank you for coming. And everybody who's listening to the podcast, see you next week. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope this episode has been engaging and beneficial to you. If it has, please like, leave a review, share us with those in your community. We know that together we can do more than any one of us can individually to improve the level of competency with which we provide services for patients with swallowing disorders. So thank you so much for being a part of this and we welcome engaging with you in the future and invite you to please tune in for future episodes. We have some exciting things coming up and with your help, we truly look forward to making a difference.